So welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to open up the scientific part of the conference. And I would like to take the opportunity to again thank the local organizers for having us uh, for a conference that is somewhat different because three uh, commissions are involved. And hopefully we will present you a pleasant kind of graphic bucket of flowers uh, where you can find your ideas, your ideas about photography, your ideas about topomomy, about atlases, about map design, um, incorporated in these mixed sessions. All sessions are mixed, so the first session will contain three papers on atlases and two papers on topomomy, but you will see that most of the papers um, interrelate between these topics and um, that um, in the end, these mixed sessions will uh, hopefully make sense to you all. Um, we decided that we uh, don't do any questions after uh, the respective uh, paper presentations. So we move discussions and comprehensive questions to the end where we have another 15 minutes to then have a more in-depth discussions that relates all five papers. For the first paper, I would like to introduce <coughs> René Sieber, a very dear friend who is uh, at the, uh, at the uh, Institute of Cartography and Geoinformation at the ETH Zürich, where he produces for a long time now the uh, Swiss National Atlas or the Atlas of Switzerland. Did I get it right? Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he will um, give us an idea of what happened over the last 25 years and what is going on in the project. So, thank you, Lenny. Ready? When I was sitting at home and uh, just thinking about what I want to present today, so I came across the topic of just the same time. So it was uh, obvious that I could tell you something about the last 25 years of uh, Atlas of Switzerland evolution, but also about the lessons learned. So please, the first slide. Yeah, so I'm talking about uh, the last 25 years of digital evolution of the Atlas of Switzerland. Um, it started, this project of Atlas of Switzerland started in 1965 with a printed version and over the time until 1997 there were um, 600 maps produced and then after that phase uh, when I came to the institute we tried to move on to a digital version. So the digital version uh, started with uh, some um, test um, atlases containing statistic information and we had some exhibitions then uh, afterwards we started in 2000 with the first digital version Atlas of Switzerland interactive it was called then in 2004 we had the second version 2010 third version and all in all uh, we just accumulated the maps so, uh, at the summit of 2,000 maps in this uh, third version. And I, I have uh, some copies here if you want to take it. It's only for Windows machines now. It's not working for, Mac, uh, for um, Macintosh anymore, unfortunately, but you can take it. So, and then we have a new area. Uh, we just switched to real 3D maps and uh, this was version 4 and it lasts until 2022. So um, we started the project with a lot of ideas and of course this then came into a concept uh, and also some um, um, uh, business plan we did also within this concept and I want to talk um, about some parts of this concept, which we had uh, UI design, web design, functionality, content, topology, and a little bit about architecture of the, of the Atlas. Um, 
my former professor Spies, Eric Spies, and Spies um, uh, sketched this uh, famous uh, feature here. And you see, we follow within the concept um, that the map is the main feature. So we get everything uh, from the map and everything is organized around the map. And another point is that we have a, a math or user center focus. So we just uh, integrated uh, user studies uh, in, in, this, uh, in this project. And it's important to have user studies to, because you don't know the user if you, if you don't know what he is, uh, how he is acting or she is acting. So, um, so just some examples here. Uh, these are two um, um, layouts, uh, the same layout, and you see here the first clicks, and then you see subsequent clicks here. Um, um, all the clicks are here gathered in this example, and there is another layout, and you see it's more clustered here in this example. Okay. Um, what is also needed? Just. Uh, Yes. Um, we designed from the beginning that we will use um, no, it's, it's really. we'll use a structured layout and structured segmentation of the information on the screen on the next one. Yes. Yeah, and we decided to use 2D and 3D visualization from the very beginning. So this is the first version, uh, an example of the first version, uh, no. first version of the atlas. Um, you see that we have um, we have uh, 3D integrated in this uh, also in this version. Uh, another point is that um, later on in this. Uh, Actual and the current version we are producing now, we said that we would look, would look a 2D map as a special case of a 3D map, as you can recognize it here, for instance. Uh, this is the same map, so it's tilted. And if we take a closer look, then you see that we use also the height of the bars to, uh, from, from, uh, to give some information about uh, this topic. Okay, next uh, is map design, not user design, user interface design, but map design. So um, the base map is, in my opinion, always a little bit underestimated. So we thought that the base map is, could be a trademark uh, mark of, this, uh, of this atlas. So that you recognize the atlas immediately, not only because of the user interface, but also because of the base maps. And the base map should always um, uh, be um, work as a kind uh, with all kinds of overlays. So that keep in mind that this is very important uh, feature, very important uh, thing to think about. Um, we have then in the last version also 3D maps and 3D base maps, and here uh, cartography is nowhere. So. It's in the beginning, let's say. So we have to think about the, the degree of realism of the 3D maps, should it be like this? So we had it in the sandbox of 1997 already. So you have that you have clouds and also water and uh, things like that, or should it be more like this in a 3D manner that it's more with, uh, with a kind of low, poly, low polygons and uh, Iconicity would be lower than the uh, realistic uh, manner. So this is uh, not decided yet, and I think it needs a lot of work to do here for cartography in this uh, respect. Um, you could also use uh, 3D visualization to, to um, put something in the 3D space, like you see here the labeling all the mountains and, and the lakes and so on. And you could also integrate 
day and night situations, temporal aspects are coded here, so that you can also use not only the, the terrain, the ground, but also the sky of the world. Okay, and then we have um, also the possibility to put uh, real 3D objects in the map, like it is the case here with these huts or this um, um, yeah, ski lifts and so on. Or you could also integrate volumes, real volumes in the map. So this is the last uh, glacial max maximum you see here, in this example. Um, this uh, could be and really uh, good for 3D applications. We could also combine this with the situation how, like it is nowadays. So these are the glaciers then uh, overlaid, overlapped on the overlaid situation of the uh, situation 10,000 years ago. Okay. Um, Speaking about functionality of these emphasis, uh, we thought that it would be good to have some special tools. We designed these tools by our own. We didn't uh, buy it, but we designed it by ourselves. And uh, we have uh, this kind of universal legend here. So this means that uh, here in this situation, maybe we have a, a geology map and uh, you see but it's uh, everything which fits on two sheets uh, in the printed version is here in this, uh, this uh, legend here. So you can just have the detailed information to click on this uh, legend part. And to make it a little bit um, more attractive, we thought about a legend that it, it's like a tool. It's not only just to depict uh, what you see in the map, but it could also work like a tool. So these were some um, thoughts about that. So if you click here on just one class, then this class is filtered out and it's shown in the map, or you can also choose more than one. So you have different possibilities to play with the map and with the content of the map. So these are just a few examples. We have also a possibility to uh, integrate the classification scheme to play with this classification, as you can see, as you can see it here. So you can reduce or, or add the classes or have a <laughs> comparison of different the topic, uh, different uh, things in the, in the map. Sorry. And you could also add GPX tracks, terrain visibility, etc. Um, concerning the content of the of the atlas, we, we tried to uh, integrate human related topics. So, sorry. <laughs> um, so, on, on the one hand, we had uh, these political topics, um, for instance, here building zones, and you see how many buildings are outside these building zones. So, this could be a political topic. And we integrated also popular topics like beer breweries. You know, we have uh, density, the highest density in Europe of beer breweries, more than Germany and more than Czech Republic because we have many microbreweries. <coughs> and uh, speaking about toponymy, we try to use endonyms for our atlas. And you see here just uh, two examples, um, two special cases. Mountain labels, you see here the, the outer fizzy stock and the inner fizzy stock, and they turned it in the, in the official map, they turned it, the outer fizzy stock is now here, and it was formerly here. So this is a difficulty which we have to deal with. And the other difficulty you see here with labels, glaciers are melting and some part of the glacier who belongs to this one uh, is now a separate one. And how to label this one? These are the problems that we face. Okay, the last uh, example is about architecture. We want to integrate 
a platform so that you can use it uh, in different ways for different atlases. We have the hydrologic atlas uh, uh, dealing with that version, but formally we had also a statistic viewer version, and we have some exhibition versions, uh, a lot of them, um, just uh, to show the content of the, of the atlas. Okay, lessons learned. Last uh, point here, uh, about the general concept, we can say that we need some kind of business plan if you have a long-term project and it worked well. Um, in Switzerland, we have the geo-information law that helped us a lot. If you can uh, go in this direction uh, with the politicians and so on, it would also help you. Um, we have a user activity tracking within the Atlas so that you can count every click that they do in the Atlas. And that's good for knowing which uh, UI you should use, which map, map you should uh, use, uh, or which map are the most likely and most liked. And with UI design, graphical user interface design, we use the UX design, that means that it is vivid, it's not sta static. And we have some visibility studies, as we have seen. We then have a 3D map concept, um, which I said were research urgently needed, and about functionality tools. Um, we have our own development and uh, more about exploration, not uh, so much about analysis. Uh, concerning Atlas content, we used interactive maps from the very beginning, and quality and originality is most important here. We have a multi-language atlas um, following our own policy, country policy. We used, try to use an atlas platform. We were not, not that successful because of limited capacity. And we had animations and simulations. Um, perhaps I have one minute more so that I can show you this one. Uh, can you click? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 yeah, just click. Yeah. So this could be uh, a simulation or an animation also of snowy, snowy regions so that you can see the snow and you can also uh, see the melting. Okay, then um, a short outlook. Um, from the general concept, uh, we have uh, more and more um, similar projects in Switzerland. So we have to think about how we can be uh, how we can have a unique selling proposition. Uh, should it be in the, in the tourism section or in the uh, popular geoscientifics or even in didactics? We didn't decide this by now, but what we know that we use something of uh, going in the direction of storytelling. So thank you for your attention and for questions after. The present change. Thank you, Rene. Since we are on a tight schedule, I would like to uh, with the second presenter, um, Philip Meyer, uh, which is a pleasure for me to introduce because he's from the same institution as I am, so we are dear colleagues uh, with the same topic to do research on. So we both do research on atlases, and uh, Philip, as an historian, is more covering the historic aspects of atlases in the 19th century. So they are, a part, this, this presentation is part of a project that um, reflects the changes and uh, the way of visualizations in the 19th century's at school atlases where they already focused on French and English atlases, and now they changed uh, for Russian atlases in the second part of their, um, of their interpretation of visualizations in school atlases. And this was Philip is going to present us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Eric, and thank you very much um, for inviting me here that I can present the project. So the slides are running. I, I'm just. 
Okay, perfect. Oh. Oh, I don't know, I don't manage to Maybe if we try the PDF one. So maybe I'll start with a general presentation of the project and okay. So the project I would like to present here today is based at the as Eric said at the Leibniz Institute for Regional Geography in Leipzig in Germany. And the project is entitled Maps and Atlases as Mediators and Traducers of Space under the Global Condition. And the project is led by our Institute Director Sebastian Lenz and also by Jana Rosa. The project is part of the Collaborative Research Center, CRC, 1199. So this is a big uh, research structure and is entitled Processes of Specialization under the Global Condition. And it's based at the University of Leipzig. And this project or research structure investigates the process of globalization in an interdisciplinary and historical perspective. In our project, we are particularly concerned with school atlases in the period from the end of the 19th century to the present day, thus, thus we are dealing with media of geographical education. And now I hope, so maybe, I don't know, and uh, maybe you can try the PDF presentation. Oh. Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. Well, I'll probably take the opportunity to put some advertising. This just finished this uh, recent and it's published, and it's um, Capography and World Research, and he's going about the visual knowledge so, production of the Justus Carpet collection. So the Capsulac in, in Bota, which was kind of ruling the whole atlas production in, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And um, he uh, really, he received two prizes for it, which is quite, quite uh, well done, I must say. And um, it's really um, a work on uh, being in the archives, like the whole project. So if you think about this project, um, they do digitizing part of, part of the project is to digitize and compare the maps, find ways to compare different maps, different map styles, different visualizations. And um, so they, they took on the uh, hard task um, to look into school letters, just certain views. And uh, Philip de Meyer just finished a school letters and is still producing the second language of So he knows exactly what. Um, 
that is still a hard way to do uh, to do proper full that task. And so what they did is they started looking at the maps and started decoding that. That's why the enormous task if you think about they did it for German English atlases, it is about the horrendous number of German school atlases produced in the 19th century. This is where um, more old book than they are they each have today. Okay, thank you Eric, very much for presenting our project. In the meantime, um, we, we have managed to solve the problem. So I'm sorry. Um, okay. Um, so in our project, we are partic particularly concerned with school addresses in the period, period from the end of the 19th century. I brought you some cover here to the present day. Thus, we are dealing with media of geographical education. We would like to analyze how school atlases represent spatialization processes, especially globalization, and what special ideas and Im imaginations uh, are generated by school atlases. Um, and the project is designed to be um, transnationally uh, comparative. In the first year funding phase, which was completed at the end of 2019, school atlases from Francophone countries, the US, and China were object of the study. The second phase, which began in 2020, is now dedicated to German and Russian school addresses. The latter being worked on by my colleague, Sofia Gavrilova, while I'm working on the addresses of, in total, six different German political entities over the course of the end of the 19th and 20th century. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, we will first examine how school atlases depict globalization on the basis of the atlases themselves. A basic assumption of the CRC is that during the long 19th century, a global special order, the so-called global condition emerged, which is distinguished from earlier global relations by the fact that it increasingly makes it impossible for regions or states not to respond to global processes such as the establishing world markets and to isolate themselves from them. Furthermore, the CRC assumes that this global spatial order emerged from the interactions and interdependencies of various socially established and politically institutionalized spatial structures. These uh, spatial structures um, are called by us spatial formats, and we are attempting to make a typology of them. Nation, state, empire, and commodity chains are examples of such what we what we are calling special formats. Together, they form multi-scale local and regional uh, special political and economic orders that form a conflictual and dynamic framework on a global level. Conflictual because of different actors who try with, within their limits and possibilities of power to find answers to the global special order and to shape and control it with the help of special forms. Our project examines school atlases to point out that they are effective media for imagining, establishing and reproducing special formats and special orders. In general, school atlases have a broad reach and they contribute to, to the establishment of collective notions of spe special formats and are thus also deeply involved in the practices of formatting space. Through the transnational comparison of school atlases, the aim is to work out how school atlases represent and construct the world differently. So that is the aim of the project, and now we, we are going to the methodological approach, um, how we decode atlases, as Eric said. In order to take a detailed look at the different perspectives that different atlases construct, we have developed a tool for analyzing atlases that allows access with a very great depth of focus. The core of this method is the decoding of atlases, that is, the capture of map features at different levels with the help of different coding schemes. And I sh showed you here the coding scheme. These schemes are based on Excel sheets and thus allow a basic quantitative analysis, analysis of the captured data. But what exactly do we collect with this tool? So 
we decode on two different levels. On the one hand, on the level of individual maps, and on the other hand, on the level of the atlas structure. The coding scheme, which you can see here, for single maps, records over 100 individual features. Type of the map, type of projection, scale, content-related topic, topics, various border and location signatures, different types of visualized data, colors used in the map, to name just a few features we collect with, with our tool. The aim at this level is to cover the map language in its individual form and by combination of data to be able to undertake comparative studies, both historically, in other words, in their de development, and spatially, so on a transregional or transnational basis. At the second level, the level of atlas, atlas structure, we capture the spatial arrangements of atlases, which in Western atlases mostly take place via the order of continents. Their order and extent, that is the number of maps per continent, makes it possible to compare the specific structure of the atlases and to obtain information about their spatial constructions. I have one example here. The cursor is jumping between the two monitors. So here you can, I, I, you can see different features we are coding for uh, individual apps. So it's a really large uh, data sets we obtain. And then you can see, uh, this um, an example for uh, uh, of a new S atlas, the gold school atlas from 1925, and you can see um, the serial structure of the different continents and uh, the, the amount of maps per continent. So this is um, how we uh, analyze. Um, yeah, this is how we analyze uh, uh, the structures of atlases. So I'm coming to the last point: uh, examples for investigation, nation state, and globalization. In addition to, deco to decoding map languages and atlas structures, the coding scheme also serves us to understand how maps depict the concepts of space that I mentioned at the beginning, spatial formats. As I said earlier, these are spatial formations and patterns of spatial perceptions that are socially established and polit politically institutionalized, so very common concepts of space. As an example, I would like to take the nation, nation states here. I brought Two examples from Western Germany uh, on the left, and the middle is from the GDR, uh, German Democratic Republic, and a Russian um, soil map with national borders uh, from a Russian school atlas. Um, so, this format of the nation state is of fundamental importance for our project. There's no doubt that for modern school atlases, the nation state has been a central category of cartographic depiction of the world at the end of the 19th century and ever since. The school atlas is probably one of the most effective media for the dissemination and internalization of the concept of a, of a territorially organized nation state, and thus an important factor in the natural, natural realization of the spatial format. Nevertheless, many maps and school atlases show the world without national borders, maps of climate and vegetation zones or population density, to name just a few examples. Such maps on a global scale tend to practice a non-territorial planetary perception. In addition, we assume that there are certainly regional differences and historical conjunctures in the visualization of the spatial format of the nation state. For example, we assume that at the beginning of the 20th century, rivers still played a much greater role in orientation on maps while in later decades this function was increasingly taken over by state borders. 
That is why we also want to systematically survey the representation of the nation state. At the same time, uh, we are well aware that much of the data that serves as the basis for maps is collected by national institutions and therefore presupposes the national territory. Just as with the political framing of school curricula, school atlases and their makers are dependent here on external factors, political factors. But with the maps, they further stabilize and consolidate the spatial format as the natural political organization. At least, this is the next slide. Um, no, sorry, Eric, this is one with the maps. Um, and at least partially opposing development has been widely discussed in recent decades, the phenomenon of globalization. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown that there are not simply opposites between the nation state and globalization processes, but complex interrelationships and graded border regimes. Mapping globalization is a challenge, as school atlas designers have confirmed in interviews with us. Nevertheless, with the help of our decoding of atlases, we try to capture differences and temporal trends here as well. If we assume that globalization is characterized by the growth of exchange relations, for example, telecommunications, goods, and migration, which are shown in the left as a, um, as, as a map from a German atlas from around 1900, and on the right side there are two maps, migration and um, network, um, internet networks, um, from an um, um, <clears throat> from the edition of 2015 from a German atlas. Um, Arrow signatures and flow lines can serve when we, we take them as markers for capturing the cartographic equivalent of those globalization processes. I quote here our working paper on this, quote, there are two ways to display flows cartographically. There are flow lines and arrows. These linear map symbols are so-called connector symbols. They are used to link two graphical objects. We therefore assume that the increase in the representation of exchanges is characterized by an increase in, these, in the use of these two symbols. So next slide, please. So we exam examined world and African maps in French and US school atlases. And as a result, we were able to find that the use of both symbols did not increase significantly over the course of the 20th century. So the hypothesis that the increase in trade relations and globalization is reflected by an increase in the use of connector symbols and maps cannot be confirmed. This can have various cases, causes. Firstly, the worldview has not altered fundamentally despite a change, especially in the discourse of globalization, or um, the second hypothesis is that although the perception of the world is changing, cartographers have either not, either not taken it into account or cartography is unable to take the changes into account. To, de to determine this, it is necessary to contextualize the analy analysis presented here, considering the conditions and environment in which the maps were produced. So, in order to interpret, interpret those data in an even more context-specific way, we are also undertaking extensive archival studies, analysis, analysis of textbooks, manuals on atlases, curricula, as well as interviews with map makers. As a result of the second phase, we hope to be able to present similar studies on the development of the representation of the nation state for German and Russian atlases at the end of 2023. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you for for for, uh, for guiding us through this through this uh, very interesting uh, system of analysis, even with all the delays with the technique. Um, I can have the pleasure to. Uh, Introduce Lilo Jan Clark, um, who is head of um, the Faculty of Geoinformation Science and Earth Observation at the University of Trento. We all know that as ITC. And it's about the ITC he's going to talk about because ITC has sometime existed now, 
and there might be the time to do an atlas yes. on the world of the IGC. So, please. Yes, thank you very much, uh, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, in the room and uh, online. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to, to present you this project. Um, and I guess it's be happy if I am able to mess up things as well. Then the I am. So, let's go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can hand over all the toys to me. <laughs> Is it this one? Yes. What did you do? Okay. So I hope I can follow the instructions. Okay. So basically, I would like to introduce a little bit about, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with ITC, what we are and what we do. Uh, we exist 70 years. And uh, I thought it, uh, because of this, it might be the time to, uh, to look back to the future and map all our uh, activities. Um, yes. So, so basically, what we do, we have, we have been established 70 years ago as an institute to train people in developing countries, uh, and we have been doing that ever since. And what we do is we concentrate on education, research, and we have all kinds of uh, what we call institutional strengthening projects. And currently, we, we focus uh, in, in today's modern world on four themes or topics. So we hope if we have trouble in geo AI, geo health, or resource security and disaster resilience, you knock our door and then we will be able to, to help you. Mind if I yes. um, and of course we, we are supported by, by a, a large group of people who help uh, to make this possible. Um, and of course, as every organization, we have nicely a uh, mission and a vision and, and impact, but you can read while, while I talk. Because we, we concentrate on the individual, the student who knocks our door and who we try to train. But such a student at home is part of an, of an organization, an institute. And of course, if you train only a single person, that might not work. So there's often a program to, to expand it. And of course, these institutes, they operate in their country, in their continent, in another context. And we, we try to uh, look at all these contexts. And here's an example of, of a network, the, the large, let's call rectangles, they are where usually our students are from. And, and in this case, we work together with uh, NASA and the so-called SERVIR organization, which also have an interest in helping with remote sensing uh, particular areas, that's the green areas on this map. And it happened so to be that the organizations running these centers in these green areas are also our traditional partners. So we now work together with them to yeah, help these uh, people and, and countries with their problems in our domains. <laughs> so what's the objective of this atlas? Well. What we would like to do is to, to create an atlas that tells the story, the narrative of ITC, that shows the impact of what we have done over all these years. And yeah, we always say, ah, we have uh, over 20,000 alumni and yeah, they saved the world. But can it be a bit more specific, both in space, time, and topic? And that's why we would like to create this atlas. We do it paper and online. And, and this presentation is, is uh, the first in hopefully a series. So for instance, at Eurocarta, we will talk far more about the technical workflow of producing these atlas, both in paper and online. But for me personally, I, I think this is the drive. I've written books on cartography, done all kinds of things with maps, but I've never produced an atlas. For a cartographer, somehow an atlas is the holy grail. So this is my, my, my last uh, trick before I uh, retire, so to say. <laughs> um, but then, if you start to project, you, you stumble in all kinds of problems. And of course, since I'm a novice in, in this domain of making an atlas, probably for many of you, these problems I would like to share with you are already open doors. Maybe some of them are not. So let, let's see. And I hope to get some advice from you later on. So, so we have issues with, of course, data acquisition. Because if you would like to uh, 
that I get from the archives of, of an institute, all the data of the students, of the projects, of the staff members, all these information, and you would like to link it to space and time, I tell you, that, that's not that easy. And, and of course, the, the memory of the Institute, in the past, they were individuals. They retired. So I'm too late with this project part. Um, of course, we have the, the, the usual data wrangling problems. Uh, then, of course, yeah, you have to decide from which perspective are you going to visualize this, because only making a map where I are randomly are from, yeah, that, that's not very exciting. You, you can make an atlas, because, but that, that, that's not what we have in mind. Um, and of course, on, on the other side, we also have to find support within the Institute. We have to make people enthusiastic that they help us in, in diving in their personal archives to, to bring these data. And then the timeline and, and the staff, we are only two. Me and a, a recently graduated uh, MSc student from our uh, joint cartography education. And we have two years only. So, for instance, one of the issues. Um, starting points, we have, we would like to make a, a map on, on the PhD candidates which graduated. Many of it is only available on paper. So again, you have to convert it into a digital environment to be able to use it. And another thing is we, we also do not only want to present these facts, but we would also like to put it in the context. And one of the interesting things in the Netherlands is that the government changes every four years and then they have a new policy. And then they have new priorities. And, and, and that means that they select different countries where development aid will go. And that has an effect on how fellowships are being issued. So I would like to see if over time these government policies have really um, influenced the way we have worked. And if our student population over time is, there's always a slight delay, is in line with these government policies. But not only from the Netherlands, but also from the European Union. So how, how do these policies influence what we actually have done? Again, getting the data is, is one of the challenges. Also, we, we have done, and this is only the last 20 years, we have done over 700 projects all over the world. But then that information is also a bit blurry. So again, trying to, to visualize these like, okay, this particular sponsor, how much projects as they provided to us, how much have we executed, how long did it take, how much money, where did it go, how many, etc. Which were our partners? So you can imagine the complexity of the maps. Then, of course, the very simple things of I would like to show the courses of cartography. How many students did follow our courses? Uh, how did it compare to other topics? Now, in the past, it was a geography course, but now it's an integrated part of a geomatics course. When did all these study codes of all these courses changed? I can tell you it's more a puzzle than making a map. That, that's quite interesting. Privacy. This is a bit of an embarrassing graph. This is the number of trips made by the staff in the last 20 years. And normally if you win, you're very proud. Um, but nowadays with the CO2 footprint, you probably have to dive behind the desk you know, <laughs> because that's me over 200 trips. One of the other revealing things that did, I also was able to calculate how many days I was on the road. And now I understand why my wife always complained. <laughs> it was more than 1300 days, and that, that's embarrassing. So, yes, I bring flowers when I come home this week. Then, of course, yeah, how to map things. We, we have to, we cannot always point everything to a country or a region. Sometimes uh, a project was partly in Mali, in Bangladesh, in, in, in Eastern Africa. How, how do you visualize this properly? Because coloring a country is easy, but these regions, that might be more difficult. And it changes all the time. Uh, also, we would like to, to work uh, on, on staff data. So, so again, but then, then privacy is there, and then it proves that the university has changed information systems several times over time. And, and they cannot go back in time. And of course, in the past, there were nicely paper reports, annual reports, no longer. So there are many gaps in, in our data. That, that's really annoying. 
Okay, so I see there uh, something got a countdown, but I don't understand that. So um, the content, I just show you a few examples. Um, we, I, I, we have in mind, we have four parts in this atlas. The first part is about ITC in general, kind of inventory analytical maps, typical project maps, and then a, a cartographic explanation, so to say. So this could be one of the first maps. This is how I can see in the 70s have moved to the Netherlands. And you would like to have a few key numbers there in the composition and the size of the staff. At the moment, these are, these are fake numbers. It's by assumption that the staff has grown and that the gender balance is slowly going to where it should be. We don't know. Our alumni, over 20,000 students. But then, for instance, in studying this, the, the database told us that we had five students from the Hertz and McDonald Islands. Have heard of those? They are in, uninhabited. So I said, how can we have five students from that place? Well, these type of errors are in the spreadsheet with all this information. Are you now going to check everything? Well, that, that's impossible with these numbers, but these exotic outliers, yeah, we probably will be able to filter them out. This is an example of all the PhD candidates. We had over 418. Um, and, okay, the coloring is not so clear because of the light, the background light, but we have different departments, different emphasis. And again, you would like to see which department has been active where. And of course, this is the overall, and then you want to, to split it out over time. And all these uh, actions you can easily do online. So we there, we, we will foresee many options that the people can interact with today. 2019, we don't have an own airline, but support a few of them, as you can see, uh, because we have uh, over 2,000 flights. That's for, you get in the plane, you get out. That what is one, considered to be one flight. And then, of course, it's also interesting to see, okay, are most flights indeed going to our target countries in, let's say, Africa? And yes, happily, Nairobi is our most popular destination, so to say. So th these type of information to come up. And I could now project my own flights in this year to see, okay, where, how did I behave? I won't reveal to you that that's not a good picture. But we have this information going back more than 20 years. So you can do all kinds of nice analysis of, okay, you know, where, where over time were these projects, again, link them to the policies, link them to the students, etc. So there are all kinds of nice things to do. This is another way of looking at it. These are the airports where these flights have started. And again, you can, you can see this. I see some red lights there, but not yet in zero. So one of the most interesting part probably will be this one. That will be, we will focus on particular projects. And, and we have been working for over 40 years in the Lake Naivasha area in Kenya. And, and then try to tell what's the impact. And, and nowadays, maybe you're familiar with the theory of change. And then at the bottom, there's this, yeah, you, you cannot see that there are the actions. We, we train students, we wrote a report, we've been active in the project. And then you can reason, okay, what was the result of this, et cetera. And then at the end, you make a, a, a better life for the people and the businesses in that uh, region. So we would like to explain all these things based on the activities we And then at the end, we would like to have a section about cartography because people who read these maps, um, yeah, they might need some help. I mean, this is just a coral plate map. And there are many um, yeah, traps where you can fall in. So for instance, we will tell you, okay, the number of classes, that makes a difference. So for all the thematic maps we have in mind to use, we will add a kind of spread like this where we try to, yeah, educate those people, so to say, that they yeah, get some help in understanding what they see. And then the last few slides are about the workflow, but that's in more detail, hopefully, later. This is the, the view, but what is more interesting here is that at the end, we would like to create a kind of yeah, component library for a hybrid atlas, which can both produce the online and the paper versions with the interactive thing for the paper to go. But here, I will tell you more about, or Jacob will tell more about the 
Vienna. That's that's the plan. Timeline. So just uh, by the end of 2024, should be able to your copy, so to say. That's it. We look forward to that. Thank you, Mr. Jan, for coming to my village. It's fine accepting your wife and having a frequent like a series of frequent like a time now. Um, thanks for for this very nice presentation of the process that we'd love to have. May I now introduce uh, Ima Eisner, who is presenting a paper um, on topography, and for me, this is now entering uh, kind of unknown lands. So I'm not very familiar with topography, despite using it all the time we've been using this so much. And um, uh, Ima is uh, telling us things about topologic roads, which was a very nice. Interesting to read in the abstract. I know I, I love to follow you on your way through uh, school, children, so for the big girls. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, until about 40 years ago, uh, school pupils in the Netherlands and other countries were taught toponymic rows as a means to memorize geographical features on maps, varying from islands to rivers and seas. In my study, I depart from the assumption that the naming order in such roads reflects the way the road creator depicted that particular part of the map. Do we do something wrong? Just something and further. Further map. Then. Okay. Um, that particular part of the, road, the map, <laughs> and this would reflect um, ordering principles in his or her mental map, the mental map of the map creator. We may assume that these ordering principles have remained unchanged, and the rows are old fashioned, of course, but my idea is that the principles might must have remained unchanged and that they are probably universal all over the world. Uh, next. Uh, number three, uh, number three, yeah, this is number three now, please. Um, yeah, in many of such name rows, the rhythm of the named elements supports the learner's memory. The roads were sung at classical level, either according to an existing melody, some song, or just rattled off in an indeterminate, indeterminate Interpreted slightly melodious way, as in the case of the lesser Sunda Islands. Let me try to reproduce it. Bali, Lombok, Sumba, Va, Sumba, Flores, Timor. That was the way we did it. Those were the days. Some name roads are acronyms, like in the ABC Islands, you may know. These are in the Caribbean Sea, um, Aruba, Bonaire, Curacao. Can I do it myself? Yeah. yeah. The, the arrow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, this study tries to investigate which organizing organizing patterns occur in such name rows, and which of them seem to reflect the mental map. Conclusions will be drawn from the order in which geographic features are enumerated. Compass points between features lie in oblong ranked objects. Uh, if a name row runs from west to east, for example, one might conclude that a reading direction should have played a part. <coughs> In non oblong geographic areas, uh, that is more or less circular or rectangular, features may either rank clockwise or anti clockwise, or there may be no clear organizing principle at all. Acronymic mnemonics were disregarded if linguistic 
orthographic or prosodic factors like rhyme play a dominant part. This is this would be a kind of playing Scrabble by means of initial letters. And um, the example I can illustrate this uh, with is are the so-called ABC islands. I just mentioned them. Here, the alph alphabetical order overrules geographic criteria. Otherwise, the acronym would have been different. It would have been ACB islands, which would reflect the geographical sequence. Uh, from west to east. Um, 41 toponymic rows were found concerning items in various parts of the world. The map shows which countries and other locations are dealt with in such rows. Most rows are Dutch. Countries on the map, on the map I show here, are marked by colors. Understandably, features in countries situated close to the Netherlands are overrepresented by far in comparison with faraway countries or features, with a clear exception of former Dutch colonies like the Dutch Indies. Name rows outside the Netherlands and the Dutch Indies indicate French rivers. Uh, very, very different things. French rivers, like uh, a row which was used in France, uh, settlements on the northwest part of the French coast. Um, very many, I, I won't mention all the examples. We will go for, um, into them later. Um, the table shows a few examples of rows. Um, the themes, like um, Baltic countries, how do you naming names uh, from uh, north to south, for example. Um, the far and away most frequent organizing principle is biggest comes first. It manifests itself in 19 name rows. Various features are involved uh, coming first in the uh, like rivers, towns, so the, the biggest river is first in a row naming a couple of rivers. Towns, islands, provinces, regions, and volcanoes. <clears throat> a surprising exception to the biggest comes first rule seems to seems the row on the major Sunda island, islands, which starts with Java, the smallest, the smallest island. To understand this, it seems inevitable to take into account that Java, with its 40, 41 million inhabitants in 1930, possibly the period in which the row was devised, Java was, as it still is, by far the most populated of the four islands. The remaining three islands going no further than 30 million totally. In cases like this, we should broaden the definition of big. The term should also be able to refer to population. Secondly, a specific organization, organization pattern was found in rows mentioning geographic features along the side of rivers. All of them are mentioned in downstream order. Two subcategories can be, can be discerned, namely rows consisting of names for villages and towns that lie by the given river and tributaries of a river. Um, we see here two examples, settlements along at the left, uh, settlements along the Nieuwe Waterweg being the name of the waterway between, uh, from Rotterdam to the North Sea, and at the right, tributaries on the right bank of the Rhine, the River Rhine. 
The downstream principle is that just thus even present if no striking fall or current that can be seen as in the new water. So it's, uh, it's very flat uh, country uh, at all, and uh, this is say then um, a north sea south naming direction was found for five times five out of 41 uh, find, finds i had for example in the row on the island series west of sumatra the north is the beginning um, the reverse order south north was however likewise found five times, among others in a row on the Dutch Wadden Islands. Now, these islands are and were not exactly on the north-south axis, in fact they are situated roughly southwest-northeast. The name, however, of the, the island of Tessel at the beginning of the row um, shows that the islands were experienced by historical name givers as stretching from south to north because the name Tessel means right as well as southern. At that time when the name was given the east used to be the dominating compass point. If the east is before you the south is on your right hand. Fourthly, a west-east naming direction might be expected to be present in name rows because uh, possibly due to the influence of the reading direction. You might expect some influence, influence of the reading direction and without having anything to do in this, in this case with any compass point. On an internet site, the question arose what if you need to remember the Great Lakes names, the Great Lakes of the United States and Canada, uh, Great Lake name in order of their location from west to east, which suggests the lake, the quest asking this question suggests a preference for the reading direction. However, little evidence affirms that the west-east direction has much influence in roads. In the road settlements on the Great Mail Road, a historical important road on Java in the Indies, and the row German Wadden Islands. Um, Wadden Islands were here. The German ones are um, in the right half of the picture. Um, is overruled by biggest come first. The, the first island is uh, uh, the biggest. While in the Po tribu uh, tributaries, yeah, yeah. Um, the Po rows, there is a row um, naming all the tribu tributaries of the Po River in Italy. It is overruled by the downstream principle. Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, only in the row Volcanoes of Java, it plays an important part. Sorry. Yeah. Um, now it's, it's all right. The same applies to an east-west organizing principle. Here, out of four rows, only one important volcano on Java. Um, it, this row runs east-west without co-occurring with a more powerful principle, like the biggest comes first. Uh, in the name rows Langstraat and Nieuwe Waterweg, not shown here. <coughs> The east-west order is overruled by the downstream principle. And in the river, the row rivers discharging into the Indian Ocean, not, not shown here, it seems to be overruled by the biggest comes first principle. Yeah. 
Ik ben er vrij na. I'm almost finished. Sorry. Um, well, uh, yeah. Uh, very quickly, the, uh, the, we see the clockwise principle at the left. Uh, this, this is the, the, the Frisian famous scale, skate tour, uh, skate rally, uh, starting in Leeuwarden and clockwise. And the right uh, picture is anti clockwise. Well, this, the conclusion is um, these uh, differences in order uh, clockwise or anti clockwise is not significant. Does not, as far as I, I can see, does not mean anything geographically or in the mental mind. Um, Compass points. Um, this is a, a map uh, showing compass names of seas with compass points. At first sight, the name Rho on seas is partic particularly interesting in this compass point, point direction connection. It starts with the North Sea and continues with a very small sea, the Zuiderzee, a very small lake, probably in the Netherlands. Then the Zuidzee, the South Sea, and L ending with the Baltic Sea. Considering that the usual order in which compass points are named, north, east, south, west, um, it might be seen the le leading principle, and this would explain the north as a starting point. The second named sea, however, is not the Baltic Sea, but the, the Dutch lake. And the row ends very close to home with the Baltic Sea. And the, Pacific Ocean is in the middle, so there's no way in seeing some system in this, not an east-west principle. Sorry, sorry, not, not um, um, an ordering uh, um, by compass points. I'll try to hurry to my end. Um, finally, Yeah, um, no organizing principle could be found, in my opinion, um, in um, a map in a, a row on the North Holland polders, um, uh, polders um, with the oldest reclamation, um, Bemster. It's starting with the oldest reclamation, the Bemster, and ends was the most recent one, but in the middle part of the road, there's no system at all. So it's not by historical order or north, south or south, north of anything. The road does not start with the largest reclamation and it ends with, well, something which doesn't fit there. Um, I'm afraid I have to skip my, uh, my uh, discussion and we uh, take have to end. <laughs>
So they're in a semantic field. And interestingly, Cesar Lopez Lema, who's presenting that, is not geographer, sorry, not a toponymist. He is a forest engineer, and he uses the example of uh, the region of Rioja to explain uh, his insights into um, the scale of toponymy. Thanks. I have a 30 minutes here for you. Many thanks uh, for the presentation. Uh, well, I'm presently introducing the, the first part of the presentation that's much more uh, theoretical. And my colleague Cesar will present the second one, the, the specific study case. Uh, please. There are uh, these four points. Uh, one as introduction. Uh, my first point uh, with the uh, three main co theoretical concepts, toponymy in itself, mapping and scale, and its relationship. Uh, the next point is the study case applied to uh, phytotoponymy that will present my colleague and uh, summing up uh, some conclusions. I don't only to, to comment uh, these specific points. Uh, uh, we, propo uh, we propose a reflection that seems to correlate uh, this th uh, these three concepts, toponymy, mapping, and scale, uh, in the double sense, theoretical one, and from an applied perspective. Uh, I want to remark that in the first part, we address some of the basic concerns associated with the problem from the concept uh, of place name or toponym in itself, in the uh, philosophical sense, we uh, may say, uh, to the difficulties uh, related with uh, its representation, the representation of the spatial content of the toponym. Uh, in the second part, we examine the problem uh, of the special representation of the toponym and the specific difficulties posed by the change of a scale. So, secondary question at this moment. I want only to remark now though, that uh, our key, uh, key question behind our presentation uh, is this one. What, uh, what is the significance, the significance uh, of a toponym in a space. The, the idea of the, I may say in linguistic terms, the semantic, the semantic field of a toponym. We may speak uh, of semantic fields, uh, of semantic field, uh, fields in, in terms uh, of considering toponymy from the point of view of cartography, geography, and the study of a space, generally speaking. Uh, so, if we look to a map uh, with. A map with uh, many. Toponyms, uh, different type of toponyms, uh, some shorter or longer. Well, uh, the question of. Uh, the relation between the toponym and the map is not easy to solve. Uh, it's uh, really a complex question. It needs a theoretical and practical reflection. So, in this context, uh, we take uh, as our point of reference the system of toponymic representation currently used by, by the cadastral survey in a state. Uh, we analyze different examples that will be presented by, uh, by my colleague. And then, uh, on the, conclusion, uh, the conclusions, we draw in a goal to summarize some of the key uses uh, placed by the way and to discuss how they might be addressed more coherently, in terms especially of the, uh, what we can uh, say uh, or present as toponymic mapping. Well, uh, facing this uh, main uh, point, main first point, uh, I want to introduce this reflection 
in the sense of the philosophy of language, uh, especially in the, in the sense of remarking that uh, the concept the concept of toponym is not at all defined, not easily defined. For instance, a, a Spanish scholar, Lomastic, Moreo Rey, uh, established uh, in one of his uh, books. A proper uh, toponym is a proper name that serves to distinguish a precious, uh, precious unique place in a given context. What is significant about this def uh, definition, in our opinion, is that it puts the, uh, the emphasis on a place name's special quality, the toponym's object of reference. That is, the place individual individualized by means of the name. Moreau uh, notes that uh, in the set of place, na uh, place names of any specific geographical area, we, we will find two main groups of toponyms. One, uh, place names whose meaning is clear. And on the other side, place names that apparently have no meaning because, says Moreau Ray, they not they not correspond to any word or natural especially in the language of spoken, spoken within the, the geographical and linguistic uh, framework standard. In this context, uh, the need is apparent to defend the idea of the importance of the role corresponding to the geographical perspective in relation to uh, the topic, geographical uh, perspective in the sense of global vision uh, over the world, or over the physical and human world. It's our belief, uh, from a geographical point of view, that uh, any toponym alive or in current use has semantic content, that is, a meaning that corresponds with the concretion in a space that the name in question has at this particular moment of time. We have already mentioned the difficulties include uh, in defining the, the fragment of a space to which, the, to which the toponym alludes uh, with any degree of precision, uh, it's clear that the, con the concept of a scale uh, is especially useful as applied uh, to field of toponym. In this regard, uh, an important consideration uh, needs to be pointed, pointed out. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the scale as a critical factor when conceiving the goodness of fit of, of a given toponym to a specific cartographic representation. It can, on the other hand, also be a factor of great utility and interest when we speak of the toponym, to, uh, toponym itself. In this case, we may speak perhaps of uh, an ideal, uh, ideal scale. This is to say, a relation a relationship of proportionality uh, between the name and the specific space alluded. Uh, it should be stressed that the, that the cause of the goodness of fit the scale of the toponym to the map is always, is always a highly complex task. Complexity that derives from the intangibility of the toponym, of the concept or it may be a consequence of the difficulties to delimit as accurately as possible the special dimension of toponym. To complete this first part of the analysis, uh, we seek to, to present within, uh, with, within the framework of, of the fit of the or correspondence between toponyms and a scale uh, described to this point some of the problems that affect toponyms when their mapping is subject to a change of a scale. If a change uh, of a scale is proposed, uh, the inconvenient derived from, uh, from abandoning the ideal, ideal scale once again appears. The concurrence of names for a linear geographical element can make it possible to choose a single toponym when a geographic reality is represented in a, simple, in a simplified, simplified uh, fashion. So, this next point. Yes, Okay, thank you. Uh, we'd like to continue 
uh, presenting a case study uh, that is uh, related to uh, uh, to the mapping of toponyms alluding to plants and vegetations in the cadastral cartography of uh, a region in Spain that is called La Rioja. Uh, especially in the case of maps drawn at more general scales, of all scales greater than one uh, ten thousand, higher referential precision is needed. Uh, the means this means that the area corresponding to a toponym is usually subject to the interpretation of the reader, and so the limits of the place are uncertain and ambiguous. For example, in this case, we have the Sierra de Moncalvillo, and we don't know exactly when it uh, begins and when it ends. Uh, the explicit delimitation of an area is imprecise, uh, also because it is inherent to the nature of the named uh, place name element or the, ge the geographic element. Uh, and in practice, in practice, also is very diffuse, uh, vague, and variable uh, over time. Here we are uh, an example of uh, a collective, a plant uh, collective, Enfinedo, coming from, uh, coming from Enfinedo, from Enfina is the Spanish name to this species, Quercus ilex, and we exactly we don't know exactly which is the extent of this uh, quality of, of this wood stump of this forest. Uh, in the case of uh, place names related to vegetation types, uh, the problem lies in the fact that the precise delimitation of plant communities is in most cases complex. For this reason, the scale ultimately determines that the delimitation of a place or a territorial entity is also imprecise. For example, uh, which, which is our idea of this uh, forest. The forest is only the, the central area of this uh, polygon or is extended to the, 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 the rest of the, of the surface. Uh, we can say that the place or territorial area has a core or an area uh, of certainty that can be delimited and an associated marginal or diffuse or buffer area. A generally accepted principle is that the progressive improvement of spatial information should be oriented to the precise determination of what is known as the toponymic area. In other words, it's spatial meaning. There are still many questions to be addressed in this regard, but for the time being, it is apparent that the information provided by the cadaster in Spain uh, has improved greatly in recent decades, uh, but uh, still has to, to be improved now. Uh, in the systematic collection of, of place names for creation of a corpus of present-day geographical names, and its subsequent transfer to a database, digitized cadastral information can be very useful. This collection of cadastral toponymy needs the elimination of duplicates and the correction of entries. The data correction should involve cross-checking with data from other sources, for example, the, the sources gathered by the geographical institutes. Exceptionally, a certain number of incomplete or incorrectly recorded toponyms that appear in the digital cluster can be corrected using thematic ways. With this information, it is possible to graphically represent the surface area to which, according to the cluster, each toponym is assigned. Uh, chorological maps or maps of the geographical distribution of vegetation are used in conjunction with the toponymic mapping for comparative purposes. And in this way, the presence or absence of the plant species or the plant color alluded to by the toponym at each location can be analyzed. 
if a geographical name uh, in conjunction with its corresponding toponymic area mentions a plant element currently absent from the area of the polygon it's re it represents, it is considered an external toponymy. Okay. Thank you. I, I will uh, finish now. To clarify, non-external uh, non-external means that all 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 or or part of the polygon overlaps with the area of distribution of a plant community. So we can distinguish external and non-external uh, toponyms. Uh, another auxiliary procedure uh, relies on quantification and the location of external uh, place names. That is, place names whose presence provides confirmation of the disappearance of previously existing location of species. For example, in the first map, on the, on, uh, the, uh, here in the link, uh, in the left, uh, we have the location of toponyms outside the area of distribution of uh, a species, and it's called Quercus Pirenaica in Rioja, which is centered uh, with those red circles. Uh, using geographical names from the cadaster whose meaning is an, uh, an equivocal and the current area of distribution of the reference species. And here we use the vegetation maps available of the uh, Spanish um, forest map at a scale 200,000 and 250,000. Uh, and on the, on the right, we have the example of a graphic output of an external toponym of the Spanish cadaster in La Rioja related to this species. One of its, possi one of its possible collective place names is Marjal. Uh, the polygon shows the, its location together with an interpretable image of the vegetation cover in this and the surrounding area. So the conclusions, uh, I will try to, to be very, very fast. Our aim has been to understand the raison d'etre of the toponym uh, from the perspective of its spatial dimension and to consider on this basis all the questions posed by its cartographic representation and particularly the problems related to the scale factor. In this context, the consideration of the methods and techniques of representation developed by cadastral cartography has furnished us with a practical point of reference when it comes to appraising the strength and weaknesses of mapping of this kind. And this is true above all that when we are faced with uh, complex, complex questions such as the definition of the actual space of the parcels, parcel, cadastral parcels of land, the links between these parcels and certain toponyms and the problems posed by the passage of time and the transformation of the natural environment, especially when seeking to establish clear correlations between the names and the specific places to which these names are applied. So, uh, thank you very much for your attention.